since there are no questions, we'll get going here. What we're going to do now is what's called beam design. I don't know, not sure. Well, I guess it's, it's that to a point with uh, some of what we're going to do. But uh, a lot of what we're going to do is, is already beams designed, and so we're not going to uh, uh, be doing anything terribly original here, of course. Um, what we'll look at, though, is specifically beams in bending. So these would be like support beams in uh, uh, roof or ceiling or floor joists, that type of thing where they're lo loaded transversely that causes the beam to bend. Uh, we'll look a little, well, at least take into account shear. However, what we're going to find as we already have, uh, maybe you put the two together, maybe you haven't quite, but uh, this will definitely be the dominant of the types of stresses uh, that we're going to see. The, the bending that leads to the normal stresses, the shear lead, of course, to the transverse shear stresses. And it's going to be the, the, the normal stresses from the bending that are dominant. So let's pull that back out. We've got, let's see, the, the maximum normal stresses we expect to see in a bending uh, type uh, load that leads to some internal moment will be the maximum moment at the maximum distance from the neutral axis. And remember, sometimes these are not symmetric in the y direction, <coughs> so that that c might be different going above the neutral axis than it is below, divided by the, the uh, moment of inertia of the cross-section of the beam, or if we're interested in just some point somewhere in between, then, uh, then we uh, only take a look at some portion across the cross section. Remember, the the minus sign is here too, but for some reason they choose to leave it off. Um, I think it's a little careless, but that's what they do. It's their business. I'm just teaching it. Where you have to pay attention to the situation itself to understand whether this happens to be negative and the bend and the stresses are compressing, compressive stresses, or if it's positive and those are tensile, um, tensile stresses. But either way, uh, for most materials, especially most typical building type materials, the compression stresses, uh, the limits, and the tension limits are available. Now, the, uh, the thing we're going to play with now for the next day or two is the fact that this part of it is geometry only. It has nothing to do with the load. And in fact, we call, we then define a geometric term called the section modulus. They use sort of a big capital S, so uh, that's how I write a big capital S myself on the board. And it's the inverse of that of that little uh, ratio we had there, that sort of sort of geometric ratio piece we had. Now, to show why that ratio is more important than either of the two alone, take a look at two possible common beam shapes we could use. Uh, let's take this to be 6 by 4. And another beam that we could use is 3 by 8. 
all we've really looked at before uh, in, in specifically choosing beam uh, shapes and understanding what the stresses are were, well, we looked at the cross-sectional area. And both of these obviously have the same cross-sectional area. So for uh, the st a straight look at the normal stresses from axial loading, like we started the class with when we first introduced this, when we looked at uh, just axial loading down the beam, uh, either beam would be just fine, wouldn't matter either way. But now that we're looking at bending stresses, where we have this ratio to section modulus, these have different section moduli. So let's figure out what those are and see why this type of thing makes some kind of difference. Remember the, uh, the moment of inertia for a rectangular beam is, remember it offhand? Yeah, that's the 112 bh cube. And then, of course, C, uh, since these are symmetric, C is going to be 1 half H. Oh, we can tidy this up a little bit before we start putting in numbers. So that makes it 1 sixth. Uh, 1 H plot changes one of the cubes above that comes to 1 sixth BH squared. But uh, B times H is just area, so this becomes even easier. We already have the area, there it is. One sixth area times H. Just, just cleaning things up a little bit. For rectangular beams, uh, things can become real simple. So for the first beam, that kind of big squat square one, I guess we could call that the mother-in-law being there. One more. Sorry, Nana, just kidding. She, I think she's given up watching this video. Uh, we have one sixth, 24 inches squared times H, which is six inches. So what's that real quick? Actually, you can do that in your head, I hope. Because we have six over six times 24. We get 24. So do real quick. And what's that? Inches cubed. So for the second beam, this 1 sixth A squared still holds. So there's the 1 sixth A and H. Now this time is 8 inches. What's that come out to be, real quick? Uh, 32. So we're still talking about the same amount of material, same weight of the beam. So uh, we don't have to worry about one being heavier than the other. However, the section modulus for this one is much greater. The greater the section modulus, the greater the section modulus, the less these normal stresses are going to be. So if we have a choice like this where the weight doesn't make any difference, the material um, might cost the same, manufacturer is not going to be terribly different. Yeah, even if these are, are lumber, um, it's just just about as easy to cut 6 by 4s as 3 by 8s through beds are, are uh, maybe a little more common. But using the second beam, you get a lot greater section modulus, a lot less normal stress for the same, same amount of material, same size, same everything. What we're really looking at is the fact that this has a lot more area away from the neutral axis. 
that's what increases the moment of inertia. That's what increases the section modulus. And if you've ever looked under a deck or anything, this is the type of joist you see there. You don't see this type of thing. You'll see this for posts, but you'll see this for floor joists. And that's because the section modulus is greater, so the normal stresses experienced in the, the material itself are much, much less. Uh, another beam that's very common is, of course, the I-beam. which looks something like that, about its neutral axis. With all of this area added a long way from the neutral axis, the section modulus for I-beams goes way up. And that's why this is the most common beam used in, in uh, construction where there's, uh, especially where there's cast beams, um, also, though, it's a very easy to make a beam like that for uh, out of wood by just bolting on some cross pieces there. And you do so, by doing so, you increase the section modulus and thereby reduce the expected normal stresses in the beam itself. So let's see how we're going to use this type of thing for ourselves. We'll take something simple. Fifteen kip load at the end of an eight foot beam. Simple cantilever loading. We know from experience, I bet, that we're going to expect the maximum moment back there against the wall. Uh, just kind of common sense uh, thinking about it. You ask anybody out there in the street, if I did this until this beam broke, where would it break? Most people would say, oh, it'd probably break here. Um, most people would just would uh, just gather that. How big is that maximum moment? So what? Which is the 8 times 15. All right, so we know that uh, the maximum stresses have to do with that, but also have to do with the section modulus. So if we take a particular material, we could say, uh, some kind of limit on it. Let's say we're using steel, so there's an allowable stress of 24 KSI. That allows us then to say, well, I need a beam with a minimum section modulus of 24 KSI giving us a minimum section modulus of you do this um, but I need it in uh, inches. The kips will cancel, we'll have feet per square inch but uh, we need it in, uh, I'm sorry we don't have feet per square, we have feet inches squared, we need inches cubed. Agreed? 60 inches cubed. So we need a beam with 60 
inches cubed as our as our best possible choice. So, where do we get a beam that does just that for us? Uh, if you have your book here, open it up. If you don't, that's all right. What we've got is a bunch of different beam possibilities. Oh, I'm just going to stop. I remember we're taking them together. Oh, that's better. All right. This is Appendix B. If you have the 8th uh, edition, that's page 801. If not, 7th uh, edition, I think, is 849. Is that right? And they should be pretty much the same tables. Um, if you flip over, we get just different beams. Come on here, baby, focus. There we go. Channel beams. We didn't spend much time with uh, some uh, asymmetric beams. But all of these things are generally commercially available. And we also have um, FPS units, feet per second, I, I don't know what that is, or SI units. All right, so we're doing a problem in English units, so we use the very first table here. And notice that one of the columns is the section modulus. Actually, two of the columns are section modulus. One's on XX axis, one's on the YY axis. You just have to look at the picture to see what they mean. So uh, it's either the beam being used as an I-beam, which would fit our problem, or you could use it as an H-beam, then you look at the YY axis. And notice there's quite a difference in section modulus by taking the same beam and just turning it on its side. The section modulus changes uh, by an awful lot. So we're looking at an XX type uh, setup where we're going to use this as an I-beam. All we need to do is go down and pick any beams that are section modulus greater than the 60. So if we get down a bit, geez, this setup does not work very much. Maybe if I shoot it out a little bit. So here's an S of 57.6. So that beam's going to be too small because the section modulus isn't going to be big enough. So we can use any beam that is just above that. So one candidate is W18 by 40. So what we can do now is list a couple beams that might work for us because that's not the only one that's got possibilities. And this uh, 18 is its approximate depth. That's the the D measurement here in the picture. And the 40 is the beam's weight per foot. That's important. Uh, that could be important because now as we're looking at real beam choices, if we get a very, very heavy beam, we actually are going to add to this load because if the beam load, uh, the beam weight is heaviness is heavy enough, it itself becomes equivalent to a, a distributed load because it also has to hold up its own weight. So we want to keep an eye on that as a possibility. So we have the W840 with a section modulus of 68.4. All right, everybody 
I see about where we are, about midway down the page. We have a section modulus of 68.4 on the W18 by 40 beam. Go down and see if there's any other beams that do okay. Notice the W16 by 45. W16 by 45 has a section modulus of 72.7. I picked that one because the next beam below it has a section modulus below our limit of 60. So just look through the tables. Uh, all that happens is the, the sizes of the beams change. That's why they're grouped kind of like they are. So let's see, there's a, we have the 1645, and let's see about a W14. W14, what looks good? What looks juicy on that? 43? Because the W1438 W14, the W38 has a section modulus that's too small, it's below the 60. So, uh, what do we say? W18, 43. No, W14, 43. At what, 62, 7? Is that right? Any others? Well, we kind of skipped past the W24s, but you can already see, man, those things are heavy. And the section modulus is way over what we need. So you shop around for a couple of those, then decide, well, it looks like this beam might be the best choice. It's got enough section modulus, but it's also the lightest of all of them at least on a first cut. There's other things you have to look at. You know, you got to call up your supplier and say, do you have any W18 by 40s available in such and then they say, no, uh, we're going to have to get those from Taiwan because we don't make anything in America anymore. So it's going to be uh, three years before we can get them delivered because there's too many tsunamis out there. And those, anyway, those are the type of concerns we need to look at. Notice that when we do this, we also have to look now at the weight of the beam. We have an eight foot beam at 40 pounds per foot. So each beam itself weighs 320 pounds. Uh, well, we're talking about a 15 kip load and so if we're putting in a 320, which is a 0.3 kip load, that's, that's hard to even show uh, on the diagram in scale with the 15 kip load that's already there. Plus, it's inboard a little bit farther, so it's not even going to have that much moment added to it. However, if we were really close on this, we might worry. You know, if we had a beam that was just barely over the 60, you better put the weight of the beam in the problem and then redo the calculation. Put the expected weight of the beam in here. Looks like it's going to be 320. That makes the maximum moment go up. That makes the minimum section modulus go down and then may uh, or go up and may uh, may indicate we have a different beam we need to. Uh, need to choose there. So that's the type of type of dance we're going to do through these these uh, particular beams. Is that 40 pounds per foot? Yeah, 40 that's pounds per foot. Uh, over here, right? Or is that like an ST or is that foot? Pounds per foot. Okay. Come on, I'm writing in the English system. 
Okay. Occasionally. All right. So as as straightforward as that. Now uh, we're going to look at some other options in a little bit, but for now we're just going to look at the straight beams right out of the the book. See what's available. So let me throw you off to a problem yourself and let's see if we all come up with the same beam as the recommended possibility. All right, simply loaded. We're going to look again and look at an I beam. Distributed load to about there, and then a point load there. Fifty kilonewtons and twenty kilonewtons per meter, and the uh, Distances that little section of the distributed load is three meter, then one meter on either side of the point load for the whole setup, and the allowable normal stress for steel is about 160 megapascals. So I want you to recommend a beam such that such that we stay below that allowable loading. It says an IV. Mark, sorry? It says it was an IV. Yeah. Use, use this, the same table we just came out of. Well, you're going to have to go to the SI units. got to figure out where the not we don't necessarily yet care where the maximum moment is but we do care what it is and you can use some of your uh, shear moment diagram things to uh, to speed that up so you don't have to actually calculate the entire thing um, you can rapidly come to uh, of what the maximum moment is. A little bit later we'll look at where it is and, and the design for that concern for right now. We just care what it is.
load shear moment relation and speed this up.
go. If we did, we'd have a couple straight sections in here because the shear is constant. But we don't need the shape of the shear curve. We just need to, or the moment curve. We just know, need to know where the maximum is, what the maximum is. We don't even care where, except that we do need to find that because this area of the triangle. So, what'd you get for this this base? 2.6 meters? Yeah. 2.6 meters. Sorry? How do you get that? You know the intercept, you know the slope, you can find then this point and you'll know what the base. Once you have that, then it's one half the base times the height. is 67.6 kilonewton meters. So that's the maximum moment so pick out a couple beam possibilities Got your cell phone? Go ahead and call up Allied Steel and uh, order a couple. Just go into the department. Whoever orders the wrong size has to pay for them themselves. Got a couple just to make sure.
notice that the units in the table for section modulus are in millimeter. So we're going to need that. What's this come out to be? Then 160? No, 100. Well, 411. 422.5. I keep guessing I'll hit it. In the third, right? Millimeters. Are you using the megapascal? You do whatever you need to do with that to get millimeters cubed, because that's what's in the table. Is millimeters cubed. third millimeters cube, so they've just locked off this part, put it at the top of the table, which makes sense, makes the table look a lot cleaner, a lot uh, simpler. Remember that when you make tables. So pick out a couple beams that have a section modulus less than that, let's see. What uh, what you all agree on? Well, less than that, no. You you need a section modulus that's greater than that. That's our minimum allowable. So uh, we need something greater than that. Okay. Um, oh, I guess I have that. Our section modulus is greater than or equal to the ratio of m max to uh, sigma allowable, I guess. Selected up there? Yeah. Which one is it? The top one. The top one? As the lightest. So, how much load then do we expect from the weight of the, the beam itself? We're going to have what? Uh, five meters of beam. 
At 33, what are the units? Kilograms. Kilograms per meter. This one, the W360-33. All right, so watch your units. What do you have to do? We need kilonewtons, uh, kilonewtons total to see how that matches to that. So 9.8 meters per second squared. That gives us the newtons per meter. We need kilonewtons. So that then is going to be the weight of the beam. I don't necessarily want to use W for that because we've already got that W in there for the beam designation itself. So it's does that make sense with the units on the weight of the beam? That will give us kilonewtons. You have that duty? 1.6 kilonewtons. Not much of a concern for the weight of the beam. All right, let's, uh, let me check. We don't have time to do a new problem, but I want to look at something else. concern is that we could have a allowable shear stress limit on this. That we'd also might need to take into concern because we do have a section of the beam that's under maximum shear, 58 kilonewtons. So we want the uh, allowable shear to be greater than what we're experiencing, so we stay under that. Now, here's the uh, thing you need to consider with these I-beams. In shear, the flanges, which are these outer parts, carry very little shear. There's very little protection. It's not that they're, they're incapable of carrying much shear, it's just that there's not much shear there. Most of the shear is in the center of the beam. So for the area calculation, you use the area of the web itself. And some of the tables have that. Some you need to figure out what it is. Uh, you've got the web thickness, which is TW. And then the height of the web you can figure is D minus 2. T, is that a flange? So for this, for this beam, what's the, uh, what's the, the, uh, What's the web thickness for the beam we picked, the 360-33? You've got a book there? Oh, yeah. yeah. 5.8 millimeters. 
for the web thickness. What's the symbol they use on that? TW? And then the height of the web is it's that D minus 2TF. Is that what they use for the flange thickness? Yeah. Variable TF? Yeah. Okay, so it would be D minus 2TF. What's that come out to be? That refuses to open that book now. So D is what? 349 minus 17. 332. Do you agree? All right, then you have to check your units so that we have, remember, the allowable stresses are generally in megapascals or kilopascals at least. So double check your units and then you can check that against what the allowable shear for the, the beam itself is. And I don't have to have that number on hand for steel. Okay. 